most of us can walk around and recognise an anonymous. We're just faces in a crowd. We don't expect to be followed and photographed wherever we go. But once your face gets in the spotlight, you're on a hit list. It's been a constant power struggle between celebrities who want to control their image and paparazzi who want to take pictures in any way they like. It's not a coincidence that they say, you know, shoot a camera. And it really feels like you're being attacked. And with the tabloids paying huge sums of money, it's an adrenaline-soaked race to get the picture. I treat it just as a hunter or a fisherman. I'm out there to get my prey, and the way I do it is with a camera. You do it for the love of the chase. It's an exciting life. It's being a cowboy. It's being a rebel. The game between the paparazzi and celebrity has led to hounding, scandals, and fistfights. The story of the paparazzi of the last 50 years is one of greed, sex, and big money. I've witnessed the work of the paparazzi from both sides of the lens. To some, they're colourful cowboys who merely fulfil a craving in our celebrity-obsessed society. To others, they're the dark outriders of the mass media. <laughs> Fifty years ago, Hollywood A-listers and their glamorous image were controlled by the studio film system. It's really true. When you stand here, you want to thank everybody you ever knew in this business. Hollywood controlled the stars completely, they controlled which movies they went in, they controlled even to the extent who they married. You would see on the silver screen these huge, huge images of the stars. There was no correlation you could make between your life and their life. They were astral beings. It was the photographers employed by the big studios who fueled the celebrity myth with glamorous portraits. But Hollywood couldn't stop the scandals filtering through to the public. New celebrity gossip magazines like LA's Confidential and Hush Hush ran stories of infidelity, drunkenness and drugs. But there were no pictures to back up the allegations as freelance photographers were kept from the stars. This all changed when Hollywood started using the cheap film studios available in Rome. Here, the Italian photographers had free reign and were ready to snap the stars having fun away from home. The cosy relationship that existed between the stars, the mass media and their public changed forever one hot summer's night right here in Rome when a group of photographers quite literally made a name for themselves. The Via Veneto with its late night clubs and bars made it the hottest place to be in town. One weekend in August 1958, Tazio Secchioroli, a freelance press photographer, and his colleagues were prowling the Via Veneto on Vespers, armed with cameras and powerful flash guns, looking for new snaps. At the Café de Paris, they spotted the ex-King Farouk of Egypt. Twice divorced Farouk was a legendary womanizer. And here he was sitting between two young women who had wild reputations and known for not wearing knickers in public. Secchioroli got a scoop, but if one great story wasn't enough, up the street was an even bigger one. Anita Ekberg, the Swedish actress and star of War and Peace, was out with her husband, Anthony Steele. As the cameras flashed in his face, the Hollywood actor fought back. The confrontation made yet another great picture and earned Secchioroli a hundred times his normal fee. A new kind of photography was born, as the celebrities were ruthlessly hunted and eventually forced to play away from the Via Veneto. Fame would never be the same again. Watching the mayhem unfold was the legendary filmmaker Federico Fellini. He was so inspired by the chaos between the cameramen and the celebs that he made a film about it, La Dolce Vita. La Dolce Vita starred that early paparazzi victim, Anita Ekberg. She played a Hollywood actress seeking fame and fortune in Rome. As in life, Ekberg is hounded by photographers. 
Fellini named the most aggressive snapper Signor Paparazzo, after an annoying schoolboy friend. He said Paparazzo suggests a buzzing insect, hovering, darting and stinging. The name Paparazzi stuck, and like mosquitoes, they were certainly irritating. At the start of the 1960s, a major technological development made any determined paparazzi virtually unbeatable. The introduction of the long-range telephoto lens meant that the paparazzi could now capture girls on film, unaware and often uncovered. In 1962, Richard Burton and Liz Taylor were co-starring in Hollywood's big-budget movie Cleopatra. It was rumoured the actors were having a real-life affair. The rumours were denied by Taylor's husband, Eddie Fisher. Then lone paparazzo Marcello Giappetti revealed the truth when he caught them in his lens. The Vatican were outraged and issued a strongly worded denunciation of what they saw as Elizabeth Taylor's erotic vagrancy. The public, though, they were far more forgiving. They loved the idea of these star-crossed celebs and wanted to know every last juicy detail of their affair. The lucky Giappetti did well out of his scoop. Sex obviously sold. Hungry for scandal, the European paparazzi hunted for new haunts. And you can bet that if there was sun, there was celebrity. And usually with very little on. But when Brigitte Bardot was caught topless in Saint-Tropez in 1974, it looked like a sneaky peek into a private world. But it was not as simple as it seemed. The paparazzi would actually make it so that they look stolen. They'll put a bush in front of them when they didn't need to, or a tree in front of them when they didn't need to, just to give it that kind of feeling that this is an intimate stolen moment. While the jet set were becoming easy prey for the paparazzi, one group of stars remained firmly out of bounds, the British royal family. In the 1960s, they were protected by an unwritten code of conduct. Royal photographer Ken Lennox knew exactly which pictures he was allowed to take and which pictures would get printed. The editors in Britain were very careful about the use of royal pictures. They loved them, they used them, but they used them small, they didn't want a big fuss made of them. It was the establishment looking after the establishment. The people who ran these newspapers were all called Lord something or other and they're still, you know, families are still there to this day. And they would go and dine with the Prime Minister on the Monday night and be at Buckingham Palace on the Wednesday night. So it was in their interest not to uh, rock the boat too much. But when Lennox was on routine royal photo duty at Aberdeen Airport, he got one picture too many. He only had the same photograph, Queen at the top of the steps, Queen shaking hands with Mr McIntosh, the airport manager, Queen steps into car, Queen waves leaving. So there was six shots and, you know, he didn't really have a seventh ever. However, this time the usual royal script went out the window. She got to the top of the stairs and her dress blew up. It left the Queen showing her bloomers. The Queen, who had a radio telephone in her car, had phoned her press office and said, I know who he is, he's a Daily Express photographer based up in Aberdeen, he's taking a picture. I don't know if he got it, but uh, my dress blew up and I don't want it. That was just the whole attitude towards it. Over in the States, pioneering paparazzi were also enjoying mixed fortunes. None more so than a photographer whose work appeared in Time, Newsweek and Life magazine, with some shots of glamorous celebrities earning him up to $1,000 a photo. In New York, the most persistent and determined paparazzi was Ron Galella. He was obsessed with two celebrities. The first was Marlon Brando, and it was an experience that left both of them battered and bruised. Even though he had taken his picture for two decades, Brando had never spoken to Galella. But this was all to change one night as Brando was leaving a TV show. Galella was waiting for him. Out of character, Brando turned round to talk. Brando stopped and says, What else do you want? You already have, in his raspy voice. And I said, I want you without the glasses, a shot without the glasses. And then all of a sudden, boom! A surprise off-guard shot to my jaw. Ron lost five of his teeth and sued Brando, who paid $40,000 in an out-of-court settlement. Still, Brando could not shake off the persistent paparazzi. Just a year later, Galella was back and fully prepared. With determination like that, Ron Galella has snapped some of the most famous faces of the 20th century. 
Galello's portraits are now exhibited in art galleries and have added to the glamour of the stars who were unwittingly caught in his lens. None more so than an American president's wife. Ron Galello's other obsession was with Jackie O. And years of stalking America's first lady paid off with a perfect paparazzi picture, right here on Madison Avenue. The first lady and America's queen was the fashion and style guru of her day. The public adored her. After the death of her husband, J.F. Kennedy, Jackie married billionaire Arionassis. She moved to New York, where she became elusive and private. Jackie was the ideal subject to use the paparazzi tool and approach because she didn't pose. You had to stake her out, follow her, and get her doing things. Then one autumn afternoon in the early 70s, Galella spotted Jackie without her trademark sunglasses. Following her in a cab, he got his most celebrated portrait. Here she is, Jackie O. In 15 minutes, I got my greatest shot paparazzi. I call it my Mona Lisa because it has the hint of a smile. That's the greatest thing on the face, not to get the teeth, to get the beginning of the smile because it holds the future. That is what da Vinci painted and I got this with the camera. The paparazzi today, they're all after the money and they go after the money shots and to me, that's not uh, admirable. Jennifer! Jennifer, look this way. Thanks for nothing. See you later. It's all about timing. All the paparazzis have now gone, and we're left here on our own. Alone, just with Jennifer Aniston. We've got the scoop of the day. It's a question of being in the right place at the right time and trusting Lady Luck to get that sensational picture and capture our own Mona Lisa moment. But in the dog-eat-dog -dog world of the paparazzi, it's all about the money shot. Forget decency, dignity and decorum. Now the public gets to see everything. <laughs> 